parents are two and a half times more likely to ask Google, is my son gifted? Then, is my daughter gifted? A recent study published by Science shows that at six years old, girls start believing that boys are smarter than them. In first grade, in average, girls have better grades than boys, but that doesn't matter. They still think that boys are smarter. How is that possible? One of the most convincing theories to explain this phenomenon is called the hidden curriculum. I know it sounds like uh, some crazy conspiracy theory, but uh, it's not, I, I promise. <laughs> hidden curriculum refers simply to the unwritten, unofficial, and often unintended lessons and values and perspectives that students learn in school or at home. Textbooks don't just teach grammar, math, geography, or science. They teach a lot more than that. They frame children's expectations for what the world is going to be like for them and for those around them. Cartoons, picture books, family movies, TV shows aren't just entertainment. Since the beginning of time, humans have used stories to pass on important values to future generations. If Little Red Riding Hood had listened to her mom, she wouldn't have been eaten by a wolf. Listen to your mom. If Snow White had followed the dwarf's instruction, she wouldn't have eaten the poisoned apple. Don't let curiosity get you in arm's way. But if we take a closer look to these stories, what are the other messages that we are passing on to our children. Let me read the beginning of two of the most famous and ubiquitous stories of all times. Cinderella. Once, there was a gentleman who married the proudest and most arrogant woman that was ever seen. She had two daughters of her own. He had, likewise, a young daughter of unparalleled goodness and sweetness of temper. Take a moment to consider that the abomination in a woman's personality is pride and uh, uh, arrogance and ambition here. And the opposite of that, the most desirable quality in a girl, is goodness and sweetness of temper. Let's go a little bit further. Soon, the stepmother began to show herself in her true colors. She could not bear the good qualities of this pretty girl. She employed her in the meanest work of the house. The poor girl bore it all patiently and dared not to tell her father, who would have scolded her, for his wife governed him entirely. I mean, this is misogyny at its purest, but uh, let's uh, isolate <laughs> a few things. The fact that the stepmother and the daughter are rivals. This is a stereotype that women are told over and over again, that the worst enemy for a woman is another woman. But the thing that I find most striking is that the fact that the father is neglecting his own daughter is apparently the stepmother's fault, because she governed him entirely. Let's take a look at Snow White. Once upon a time, a queen sat at a window sewing. While she was sewing, she pricked her finger with a needle, and three drops of blood fell upon the snow. The red looked pretty upon the white snow, and she thought to herself, I would like to have a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as the wood of this window frame. Basically, Snow White is a victim even before she was conceived. So the image of a woman seeing blood on the snow, which is a, you know, a pretty violent image, especially if you consider that this is a children's story, and think, oh, I would like to have a daughter, when you're bleeding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are just two stories, but we could list examples for days. We tell boys that it's good to be fearless. We tell women that by being fearless, they will end up poisoned or eaten by wolves. <laughs> Unless they seduce the enemy, that is. And Beauty and the Beast is a great example of that. A romance between a captive woman and the monster she at first believes might physically attack her. Disney did a great job at cutifying the beast. But if we look at the traditional illustrations of the story, the fairy tales appear in all of its brutality. When you wonder why so many women choose to remain in abusive relationships, think about the hidden curriculum.
Think about the fact that these stories have been retold in many different ways, in many different media. Sometimes it's easier to recognize them, sometimes it's not. But they are archetypical stories, and as such, they have inspired a huge portion of the stories we consume every day. I know what some of you may be thinking. These are old stories. Times have changed. What about Moana? What about Frozen? Brave. Those are new, right? Don't they feature brave girls doing brave things? Yes, they do. And it's certainly true that today there is more female-driven entertainment than there was uh, even just a few years ago. But these are exceptions, and they can cloud our judgment. So it's important to go back to the data and take a look at what is the current situation of the media in general when it comes to female representation. 100% of children's books have at least a male character. 25% of children's books do not feature female characters at all. Think about all the books with animals, for example. Animals are male by default. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen a female squirrel? I don't think so. 37% <laughs> of children's books don't feature female speaking characters. When we look at children's television, we see that when it comes to female characters, only 18.5% have a job or professional aspirations, versus 81.5% of male characters. Children use stories to make sense of the world. They use stories to understand what their place is going to be, what is expected of them, what is okay and what is not okay. What kind of world are we creating by telling these stories to our kids? The answer is easy. A world that doesn't value women's work as much as men's. A world that doesn't value women's lives as much as men's. A world that makes women feel constantly under attack, sometimes under the threat of physical violence, sometimes asking them to constantly prove that they are valuable for things that are other than giving birth. That a woman deserves to live and take up space and speak her mind and build stuff and question how the world works, that is not a given. It's tough to listen to these words. It's hard to say them, but it's even harder to live every day with the consequences of not considering gender equality one of the key values to transmit to future generations. The good news is that we can do something about it. We can change the kind of stories that we tell to our children and make sure that gender equality, not misogyny, is one of the fundamental values that we pass on to the next generations. And this is why, in 2016, my partner Elena Favilli and I created a book called Good Night nice Stories for Rebel Girls. One of the problems with female representation is that women have long suffered and still suffer from being idolized. Positive female characters are often portrayed as something out of a man's dreams or desires. So we thought, what if we started telling kids stories about real women? What if the stories we told our kids showed them how brave, resilient, creative, fearless, so many real women have been throughout history? What if we could tell stories where women don't compete against each other to marry a prince, but rather they form alliances to defy dictators, as in the case of the Mirabel sisters, or to write the history of tennis, as in the case of the Williams sisters? What if, in our stories, stepmothers helped their daughters become Olympic champions, as in the case of Simone Biles, instead of hiring hunters to kill them. We could tell stories in which husbands are responsible, caring human beings who support their wife to become a champion, as in the case of the Italian cyclist Alfonsina Strada, whose parents had hoped she would give up on cycling after her marriage. But instead, her husband gave her a new bike as his wedding gift. We use this as an opportunity to tell people stories they hadn't heard yet like the story of the female pharaoh who came long before Cleopatra. Her name was Hatshepsut, and after a reign, she had been erased from history. Her statues had been destroyed, well, almost all of them. Some were likely recovered recently, and archaeologists were able to 
piece our existence back together. It gave us an opportunity to tell unusual stories, like the one of Maria Sibylla Merian. Maria Sibylla Merian is the German scientist who discovered the metamorphosis of butterflies in the 17th century, in an era when the scientific community believed that butterflies sparked out of mud. Maria wanted to be a painter, but she wasn't admitted to the watercolor class that her father taught because she was a woman. So she gathered flowers on her own, placed them on a table in the garden, and copied them on canvas. Sometimes, caterpillars would be on the flowers, and she would copy them too. And day after day, she observed that they were turning into butterflies. So she wrote a book about her discovery. But because she was a woman, and because she didn't speak Latin, no one uh, believed her. Maria didn't let that discourage her. She sold all of her paintings, she took her daughter, and left for South America to study the butterflies of Suriname in their natural environment. She learned Latin and wrote another book, full of drawings and studies of insects no one had studied before. This time, people started to notice. This women's resilience, the fact that they had the courage to trust their own experience more than the multitude of naysayers that surrounded them, the fact that they changed the world through their work, really captured people's imagination. Parents started emailing us and sending us Facebook messages telling us that they had to read the book on their own first, because otherwise they would get too emotional when reading it to their kids. Children love the fact that these women are real, that they can look them up, they can discover more, and that because there is no magic, these women's achievements can actually be their achievements. We never thought of going through a publisher. We wanted to be the publisher. We wanted this project to be different, not just from the creative standpoint, but also in the way it was produced. We wanted it to be female-led and community-powered from A to Z. So we turned to Kickstarter. We worked on the campaign for three months. We did the shooting, the video editing, the sound design, everything. In April 2016, we launched with our heart in the stomach and the goal of $40,000 to print the first thousand copies. We left no stone unturned. We studied each successful campaign, reached out to every journalist who could remotely be interested in the stories that we wanted to tell. On April 27th, at 8 a.m. Pacific time, from the kitchen table of our one-bedroom apartment in Venice Beach, we hit the launch button on Kickstarter. Minutes later, people started to pledge. And 29 days later, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls had become the most crowdfunded book in history. 13,500 backers from 75 countries had pledged $675,000 to bring this book to life. Apparently, we weren't the only ones thinking that maybe we should try and tell children different kinds of stories. The biggest names in publishing put on our table seven figures deals, but we chose to ignore them. Many thought we were crazy, many still do. We had never published a book before as publishers. We had no contacts of printing companies. We had never distributed a paper book. You see, when a man finds himself in this situation and decides to proceed in a way, people call him a, a visionary. For women, they use the word naive. So we were naive that way. But uh, after all, we had 13,500 people who thought we could pull this off. They had given us their money to try. So we did try. You know, this amount of trust is not something that we women get to experience very often. Most of the women featured in our book never experience this kind of trust, no matter the importance of their discoveries, the audacity of their adventures, the width of their genius. They were constantly belittled, forgotten, in some cases, as we saw before, almost erased from history. So we wrote the book, selected the artist, we found a great employee-owned printer in Canada, we put together a beautiful hardcover book featuring 100 bedtime stories and 100 portraits inspired to the life and adventures of 100 extraordinary real women from all over the world. The portraits were created by 60 female artists from every corner of the globe because we really care to show kids that beauty really does come in any shape, in any size, in any color, 
and at any age. Today, I am proud to tell you that Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls is on the nightstand of about 850,000 children all over the world. It is translated in 35 languages, and it's number two in this week's New York Times bestsellers list. Thank you. The Kickstarter campaign we launched for Volume 2 broke the record established by Volume 1. Over 15,000 people pledged almost $900,000 to bring the second book to life. Today, the company we created, Timbuktu, employs 15 people full-time and about 100 artists. It is a fast-growing, diverse group of rebels working from all over the world to empower girls and women by bringing them new stories delivered in innovative ways. Not signing the deal with the publisher allowed us to create a company that embodies the same values as the book, and that mattered to us. We're basically taking indie publishing to places no one thought it could go. It is important that girls understand the obstacles that lie in front of them. It is just as important that they know that these obstacles are not insurmountable, that not only they can find ways to overcome them, but we can remove the obstacles for those who will come after us, just like these women, the women in our books did. There is nothing more powerful than stories to pass this message on to future generations. The greatest sense of accomplishment for us came in a very unexpected way. Time and again, people started messaging us to say that they had discovered the story of a woman in our book. And sometimes the story they mentioned wasn't there. So the fact is that Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls is training hundreds of thousands of people to see stories that they couldn't see before. It's inspiring them to look for talent where they thought there was none. It's making it easier to find potential in unpredictable places. It's making it easier to see beauty where we thought there was none. Before leaving, I want to read to you one of our stories that I like very much from the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Wangari Matai that I think can inspire us all to dream bigger, aim higher, and fight harder. And when in doubt, to remember that we are right. We women, I mean, men don't need that reminder. <laughs> uh, once upon a time, in Kenya, there was a woman called Wangari. When lakes started to dry up and streams started to disappear near a village, Wangari knew she had to do something. She called a meeting with some of the other women. The government cut down trees to make room for farms, but now we need to walk for miles to collect firewood, one said. Let's bring the trees back, exclaimed Wangari. How many? they asked. A few million should do it, she replied. A few million? Are you crazy? No nursery is big enough to grow that many. We're not buying them from a nursery. We'll grow them ourselves at home. So Wangari and her friends gathered seeds from the forest and planted them in cans. They watered and looked after them until the plants were about a foot tall. Then they planted the saplings in their backyards. It started with a few women, but just like a tree sprouting from a tiny seed, the idea spread and grew into a widespread movement. The Green Belt movement expanded beyond Kenyan borders. 40 million trees were planted, and Wangari Matai was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her work. She celebrated by planting a tree. Thank you very much.